Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, Boom Supersonic rolled their XB1 Baby Boom Supersonic test vehicle out to the runway at Mojave, escorted by a pair of chase planes. It climbed to its target altitude, and then after checks, it lit all three of its afterburners, accelerated forwards. We watched the Mach meter climb and then hang, frozen for a few seconds as we wondered what was happening. And suddenly, after a moment, we saw it go supersonic. Now, the pause around the supersonic transition is because you're using air data instruments measuring the air you know, to detect that you are going supersonic. And the transonic effects can mess with things. They can create low pressure regions, high pressure regions. When you've not gone there, it's hard to actually measure this thing successfully. So, look, this is sort of a big deal because this is a civilian privately developed aircraft which is going supersonic on jets in horizontal flight and many people are saying that's the first one and it is the first one with a number of qualifiers for example spaceship one and two both have been developed at mojave and launched out of mojave those actually go supersonic but they're rocket powered and they go to mach 3 in a vertical climb this is much more the kind of flying that you would do if you're carrying passengers in an airliner. Regardless, congratulations are in order to everyone involved, to the designers, the engineers, the people that did the wind tunnel work, and of course, the mechanics on the ground and the pilots in the air. Tristan Geppetto Brandenburg was at the controls once again. He's the guy that actually showed me how to fly it when I visited it back in September and I had a go in the simulator and had a reasonably good time at it. You can see him visible in the cockpit there. Uh, the cockpit, of course, doesn't offer much visibility. We've discussed that in the past. Behind the XB-1, you can also see one, uh, one of the chase planes. That is a Mirage. This photography is being taken, I believe, from a T-38. And, you know, I think it's worth a, a mention of how this footage is being captured and streamed live. So, you know, in the old days, you might have like a, an aircraft with a special camera and audio-video broadcasting equipment, which would downlink it to the ground. This would all be very expensive, require lots of licensing. But no, in this case, what they did was they bought a Starlink system and not even an aviation Starlink, as I understand. They just put this, you know, at the top of the cockpit looking out to the sky. And that provided a downlink connection at multi-megabit speeds. Then the person that was sitting in the back seat, they literally got an iPhone out, they put it on the network, and they started streaming the iPhone footage down to the ground. That is how they did this. And it is a whole lot cheaper and simpler. But to be clear, the aircraft behind, you can see a pod that it's carrying underneath it. It looks like an external fuel tank. That's actually carrying, I think, I believe it's a pair of IMAX cameras that will provide stereoscopic imagery. So now if you're paying attention to the display at the bottom, you might have noticed the engines have dropped their afterburners off and it's now slowing down. Now, this test flight was occurring over Mojave, over like Edwards Air Force Base, and there is a section of airspace there that's called like the supersonic test flight corridor there it's a very small part of america where it is legal to fly aircraft at supersonic speeds if you are cleared into it one of the big reasons that concord was never a commercial success was that it was never allowed to fly supersonic across the continental usa and that is well that was largely because yeah, the U.S. plane manufacturers didn't want to have a European competitor, and so if their buddies at the government could give them some helpful laws, they were going to take that. So I am sure that Boom Supersonic will be talking with the legislators to start carving out suitable exceptions for their large overture passenger airliner. And so I kind of want to rewind a little and talk about the start of the stream, because this actually was one of the most watchable live streams I've seen for an event like this. And it was basically, I mean, for me in particular, it was the fact that the, the stream at the start was just some like background music, some simple visuals, you know, I think drone shots basically moving around and ground crew and pilot just talking through the checklist, making sure everything was in place. And this takes a long time, but it was a great way of building anticipation. And it gave us like an idea of what was going on. It really let people that weren't used to it 
get a good look at the vehicle in question. So like the XB1 demonstrator was first unveiled in 2020 and it you know, went through some ground tests, taxi tests and started flight testing last year. The main fuselage is carbon fiber composite. It was made in two halves and then you know, bonded together. There's obviously a lot of metal stuff at the back. You know, the, the engine section is much more like bent metal that's riveted. There are three engines on it using ramp intakes. I believe they're J8515 engines. It has relatively short, highly swept delta wings on it to provide, you know, high Mach performance. That means it lands at quite a clip, let's say. It takes one crew member, and of course it has instrumentation all over the place. The, in the pilot can't see out the front particularly well, especially during landings. For that, uh, they have a camera system that is used to actually perform the final alignment and touchdown on the runway. And again, I flew the simulator. It's relatively easy to use once you know it's there. And of course, this is the kind of technology that they're testing here because the real aircraft, or rather the full-size passenger aircraft, that's going to have to have the same kind of attitude during landing because the aerodynamics are essentially very similar. So they have to make sure that pilots are able to control it through that. And this is also serving as a demonstrator or a test platform for the engineers that are working on the larger aircraft so, you know, so that they get some experience in designing the supersonic you have properties and understanding the dynamics. It's all like building in-house experience for this much larger, more ambitious aircraft. And if you want to know more about that, go and check out the previous video that I shot back in September. That has a lot more details on this. I'm just more interested in this particular experience. So we got some pretty cool tracking drone shots as uh, they started to roll out to the runway. You can see the Mojave Boneyard out in the background, a whole bunch of jets that are basically stored in the desert because, uh, you know, it's the, the environment is pretty benign. It's dry. So, uh, yeah, you can just leave the aircraft sitting out there and pull parts off of them when they're needed. Now, as I mentioned, there were actually three aircraft involved. There were two chase planes, and these obviously had to be high-performance aircraft that were able to keep up with something that was traveling faster than the speed of sound. So these were basically civilian converted versions of military aircraft. The first one that was following up is this Mirage, which uh, French design, and it had uh, this you know, camera pod that was hanging underneath it. And the one at the back, that is the T-38. And I'll point out that the XB-1 has three engines, the Mirage has one engine, and the T-38 has two engines. So yes, there is some pattern here. Anyway, uh, yeah, after getting set up, they all roll onto the runway because they want to take off close together so they're not spending a lot of time getting into formation. And it's actually quite complicated to perform a takeoff like this when you have three different aircraft with quite different performance characteristics considering that you know engines that are different sizes spool up and down at different rates and develop different thrust um, and it's also interesting to see when they switch over to the iphone camera look at how bright those colors are that looks really beautiful doesn't it and it is literally guy sitting in the back seat pointing the camera out the window i i think it's actually pretty cute that this is the easiest way for them to do this. And you could also see from this angle the camera pod that's slung under the Mirage there. And so now this is the takeoff. Look at the telemetry at the bottom. See the engines are already like sitting at about 40 something percent and then they spool up to 100 percent. Now these engines are pretty laggy. This is, I believe, what the is being requested rather than what's necessarily being delivered. But with the afterburners kicking in, you can see how quickly this thing is starting to roll down the runway and reach rotation speed. Uh, remember, I was landing the simulator around this speed. And then it takes off. Notice how long that landing gear is because it needs to be that long during the rotation. Like the attitude that it has to take during that initial turn means that the rear is going to drop a lot and the legs want to be behind the center of mass but not too far back because the further back they go the more the uh, elevators have to pitch up to get them 
uh, you know, to get the nose lifted up. But yeah, as soon as it took off, you see that the Mirage was chasing it. Uh, and yeah, you can hear the commentators in the background, by the way. They actually, you know, had a, had a lot of fun things to say about this. The British guy you're hearing is Mike Bannister, who used to be chief pilot for Concorde before it was brought out of service 20 years ago. Hush approach, uh, good morning, test through 1-1, one, one. this is flight of 3 of Mojave, passing 5,300, join 2515 and on the corridor. Yes, yeah, so 1-1, we'll Josh Roach, good morning, the uh, Epidot Center is 3004, stay left, hang up, please. So yeah, that's the radio call they made for joining the airspace. Joshua Approach controls the airspace. It's named for the Joshua Tree Park. They control most of the airspace around Edwards, including the uh, the very famous Star Wars Canyon and the Jedi Transition, which is a region where aircraft will try low-level you know, can canyon passes, and we see awesome videos. But as you hear, these three aircraft were looking for the supersonic corridor. Three minutes into flight, we get the first real air-to-air -air footage. They've all formed up, and they're basically climbing up to their test altitude of 35,000 feet. During the initial climb, which obviously is a quite steep angle, you think about it, the three minutes into flight, they're already at 20,000 feet. So they're climbing at like 6,000 feet per minute. Um, this is done on without afterburners you know the afterburners are really only used once they were getting up to for takeoff and then they're going to be used for shooting through the sound barrier and of course i say sound barrier and we all know there's no such thing as a sound barrier right that was just like a myth that was in the you know the 1940s they knew that something crazy happened there and there were people that thought you would never beat the demon that was the sound barrier but we all know that, yeah, you can. You just need to understand it, embrace it, and punch your way through it. They had previously been slowly raising the speed of each test flight, and they had reached Mach 0.95. And for this next one, people, you, know, you might have thought, well, they'll just go up to Mach 1. No, 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 no. They want to go faster than the speed of sound. Because actually sitting at the speed of sound is kind of a hairy place to be. It's where the biggest change in the flight performance ha happens, right? So aircraft tend to be limited in their Mach number because as you start to hit, you get towards the speed of the sound, the airflow that is being pushed around your aircraft is being accelerated because it's flowing through less space. And that means you'll have areas where you start to have supersonic flows temporarily. You'll have shock waves forming even in subsonic aircraft and i've i've seen subsonic aircraft making shock waves above their wings i've just and when the conditions are right you can see it so when that happens it means you've got this region where the air pressure is going from very high to very low over a very small distance and as the attitude of the aircraft or the um the speed of the aircraft changes this position moves back and forth it can oscillate and that means that the lift characteristics of the aircraft are moving very, very quickly. So the whole idea is that when you're close to this uh, you know, maximum Mach, you're going to get what's like called Mach buffet, potentially Mach tuck, where your nose goes down. But this buffeting is not great for flying characteristics. And that's why for this test, they really want to just punch through, get to the other side, and verify how the aircraft performs on the far side of that, uh, above Mach 1. It is, by the way, possible to see these shock waves that are generated, not like as like a vapor cone or anything like that, but just the way they distort the air. If you look at the back, you'll see there's like a vertical distortion. That is a shockwave that's been carried along. And this is not supersonic, it's Mach 0.95. But the air is getting pushed out of the way, and in locations, it has to move faster than the speed of sound to squeeze through. So I already showed you the first time they went supersonic. That ended, I believe, when they like ran off the end of the airspace or something. They had to do a U-turn, come back around, and then get set up for a second pass. Because they have to do these various tests. What they're doing is they have like flutter generators, and they'll test control deflections to see if the vehicle remains passively stable. But yeah, afterburners lit, sitting at Mach 0.97, and again... The air system only realizes it's supersonic after it's been there for a few seconds. 
And then presuming that air data is coming from that probe that's sticking out the front, and ideally they would eventually want to get rid of that and move the instrumentation inboard. Anyway, this second excursion above the sound barrier, it didn't last very long. They were very quickly told to knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. And that's a call out from mission control in this case. It's generally reserved for safety critical um, moments. So I don't know if they saw something or somebody saw something with the aircraft that they were concerned about or if somebody else was just potentially getting into the airspace and getting in their way. But apparently they had the fuel reserves to take one last go at it. Again, lighting the afterburners, watching the Mach meter stick at 0.97 before it finally realizes that it is in fact going faster than the speed of sound and tells the rest of the aircraft to start displaying that. So I think this is the final, this is, well, this was the run where they got most of the work done. Again, using the flutter excitation system, control inputs and everything else. This is being a test pilot. You know, they have plans for these tests laid out. They know the sequence of things that they want to validate uh, and they have to go through all of this. They want to make sure they get things done efficiently and collect that data so that they can understand how this aircraft flies. And also, they don't want to push their luck. They don't want to go faster than they're supposed to and potentially enter into circumstances that have not been anticipated. This is them pushing out the envelope for their test flights. And there, I believe there may be a couple more test flights in this before the aircraft uh, is essentially grounded and the work is really transferred onto the larger boom, the overture, right? That's the four engine passenger airliner, which is going to have broadly, well, some heritage, some characteristics that shared with this. And uh, equally, it's going to have a whole lot of things that are very different. You can see him here actually performing a turn at supersonic speeds because, you know, guess what? If you're flying an airliner through airspace, it's pretty important to be able to turn when air traffic control tells you. This thing has relatively small stubby wings, so it turns, well, somewhat more gracefully, let's say, or lethargically, depending upon your point of view, than these chase planes, which are designed as fighters. They're designed to be able to maneuver in air-to-air -air combat, and therefore they can turn. Okay, well, the T-38 is a trainer, but it's not going to get into combat, but it is designed like a fighter jet. And so after a few hard-won moments at supersonic speeds, the mission ends. The XB-1 returns to the runway at uh, Mojave. Again, look at the high angle of attack that it needs to use during that landing configuration. Again, congratulations to the team on doing this. Congratulations on uh, Tristan for getting on the center line. That was something I never managed to do, but he has a little more experience than myself. So it looks like Boom can claim a good flight, and uh, maybe we'll talk more about it once we get more details. But for now, I'm going to say congratulations to everyone involved. Uh, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.